I'm sure we all remember our parents telling us it's all fun and games until somebody loses an eye. <laughs> and that's our goal is not to lose anybody's eyeball. My goal today is to try to help you counsel your patients on proper protection for childhood sports, be able to identify key exam points for ocular trauma, recognize signs for an ocular emergency, and provide even better support for our patients. 100,000 people can have sports-related injuries. 40,000 of these patients will have an eye injury, and about 13,000 of these patients can have a permanent blindness. 90% of this can be preventable. So as far as for pediatric eye injuries, 70% of them will require major surgery. About 30% may require two or more surgeries to preserve as much vision as we can. A quarter of them can result in monocular blindness, and again, 25% can result in severe visual impairment in one eye. So what kind of activities can lead to eye injuries? It is a plethora. Kids are going to be kids, and they're going to be doing a lot of different activities. Baseball has been shown to result in about 26% of the eye injuries, but air rifle, BB gun injuries, paintball injuries, Nerf gun injuries can also result in that. Most common types of injuries that we will see are penetrating injuries, blunt injuries, and you can also see radiation injury. Radiation injury sometimes in winter sports and more um, colder season for skiing and not using proper eye protection. So these are just some of the examples of some of the more serious ocular injuries that you can have. This is a chart from the American Academy of Pediatrics showing you what is the relative risk for each type of sport. So the higher risk sports are going to be the ones that involve a small and fast projectile or a hard projectile. Also close contact sports where you have as far as basketball or you have intentional injury as far as boxing or martial arts. The lower risk and eye safe sports are the ones that you are not going to have much contact with each other, track and field and gymnastics. So about nine times you will have males being affected more than females. Trauma is going to be a leading cause of visual impairment. Usually it's unilateral. What's going to be important is whenever you counsel these patients is that a unilaterally blind child is more likely to become blind in the second eye compared to a bilaterally sighted child. So if you already have a patient that has had an eye injury or have an eye problem such as strabismus or amblyopia and they're not wearing their proper protection, they can be at higher risk of losing their other eye. So as far as pediatric eye injuries, about 80% of them are going to happen in males. 90% are going to be from BBs. We will see 67% from firework injuries and about 50% from sports related injuries. 20% would be from motor vehicle accident, and usually this would be from a motor vehicle collision or sometimes even if the airbag is deploying, depending on where the child is sitting. So I wanted to go over the types of injuries that you may see in your pediatric office or also if you're in an urgent care office. So you can have periocular diseases as far as lacerations, orbital fractures. They can sometimes be mild, such as a subconjunctival hemorrhage or a corneal abrasion or you can have ocular non-penetrating injuries but can be vision threatening. These types are going to include a corneal foreign body or a hyphema. You could also have cataract or lens dislocation, retinal damage or traumatic optic neuropathy, and rarely a retrobulbar hemorrhage. You can also have perforating and penetrating injuries such as open globes and intraocular foreign body. And sometimes ocular trauma can occur even from systemic injury, such as these types of retinopathies that you will see if they have full contact injury. So this is just a review as far as the anatomy of the eye. So you have the eye wall penetration, either a scleral penetration or a perforation. Any of the perforation, you actually have it going through the sclera, conjunctiva, and into the retinal vitreous space. So if you have a perforating injury, those are an emergency because they can be at higher risk for infection and they can lose their eye from an endophthalmitis. As far as how to start with an injury, 
um, how to evaluate the patient, you actually want to start off as soon as they walk into your office. You want to get a good history, ask what kind of surgeries that they've had, have they ever been treated for any visual impairment as far as amblyopia or strabismus, do they wear contact lenses or glasses. As far as event history, you want to ask the time onset of it and any treatment rendered prior to arrival. So we always start off from the eyelids, from the front to the back. So you want to take a look at the cornea, iris, anterior chamber, the conjunctiva, and sclera. So this is reviewing some of the anatomy on the ocular side. So this is your lid margin. Anytime that you have a laceration, you want to make sure that it's not involving the lid margin or the canaliculus because those will need to have surgical repair. So how you evaluate as far as the key features of the eye exam. You want to actually start with the vision. So as soon as they walk into your room, you want to look at monocularly. So if the child is scared, you can have the parent cover their eye, or as soon as you walk in, are they tracking you? Are they looking at you? So you can at least see, do they have a fix and follow? Now, we have phones nowadays, and you actually can pull up YouTube Kids very easily and have the patient feel more comfortable doing that and if you don't have a toy to see on how much they can do. If they're more verbal, then you can try once they feel more calm that you could do HOTV matching charts such as this one or if you have a near card. But if you can even just try to see will they fixate and track you, then at least you know they have some sort of vision on there. You want to look at the lids and agnexa and then if you're suspecting orbital injury, feel for any orbital step offs. At the same time that you're having them track you, you can also examine their cranial nerves. Look for the third, fourth, and sixth nerve palsies, or also look, if they can't follow you, do a quick doll's head if you don't suspect any neck injury. A quick direct ophthalmoscope exam can give you an exam for the pupils to look at the size and shape and looking for an afferent pupillary defect to show more a traumatic optic nerve injury. If you have it available in your office, you can do fluorescein staining, again, to look for any corneal epithelial damage or if you have a leaking wound that would make you more suspicious for an occult open globe. You can consider getting other studies, such as a CT scan. We usually prefer that because it can show more of the intraocular foreign bodies as well. If you have it available, you can ultrasound the globe, but again, you want to limit pressure for any injury that you're considering. So this is just looking for when to consult for ophthalmology. The urgent ones are gonna be the surgical open globes intraocular foreign bodies. Non-surgical that's going to be urgent are any severe chemical burns or hyphemas. As far as less urgent within the next day, corneal foreign bodies if they're non-penetrating, hyphemas again if they're partial and non-painful, and then also subconjunctival hemorrhages or small corneal abrasions. So I'm gonna go over just some of the eye exam findings that you can look at for some of the injuries that you'll see. So for a lid laceration, you always wanna look for any possible globe injury. This is showing a lid margin laceration and also a canalicular laceration. Sometimes some of the canalicular lacerations can be missed, especially if there's a lot of blood and debris around that area. So it's good to clean off the area so that you can actually see where it is. The reason why is a lot of these are usually due to either dog bites or trauma from a finger poke basketball, if they're trying to grab the ball, they can have that type of injury. So you want to see if it's full or partial thickness involving the lid margin or the canaliculus because those will need more urgent repair. We usually will want to repair this within the first 24 to 48 hours from the injury. And again, looking for any other ocular injury. We usually will cover these patients with a broad spectrum antibiotic so that we can cover for skin flora. The canalicular lacerations are going to be important because we actually would like to put a tube so that this silicone tubing will keep this nasal lacrimal can, uh, and the canalicular area open so that it doesn't close up while it's healing. Orbital fractures are also gonna be something that you'll see, especially around the summer months and spring season. This can even happen even if they're wearing helmets or their face mask. Depends on the actual penetrating injury that you'll have. So you wanna look for periorbital ecchymosis any motility deficit, so this person is actually trying to look up and this eye is not moving up, or any orbital rim step offs. And how this is happening is that the actual force, either by the baseball, softball, or fist, can actually cause blowback. And that 
increased intraorbital pressure causes a break in the weakest point of the intraorbital wall. Again, we want to tell them to avoid nose blowing and cover with broad spectrum antibiotics. As far as for surgery, it depends on where the fracture is and what other ocular signs. So the patients that you need to watch out for that's going to be presenting to your office are usually the patients that look the least as far as the ecchymosis. These kids usually may have been wearing their helmet and they may present to your office more for nausea and vomiting. These are the kids that can have a white quiet eye and an orbital fracture and they can have what they call a trap door floor fracture. And what's happening is as they move their eye around, so this is straight ahead, and as they try to move the eye, they can't because they have entrapment of their inferior rectus within that fracture because of the size of the fracture. And why they're presenting to you with nausea and vomiting to the pediatrician's office is because they're eliciting the oculocardiac reflex. And what's happening is as they move the eye, that inferior rectus is trapped and they're eliciting the vasovagal nerve to cause them to have bradycardia and nausea. So this actually needs to be repaired urgently within 24 hours of the injury as soon as possible so that that muscle can be relieved and the ischemia can be relieved because that will help with a muscle function for the future. You often will see subconjunctival hemorrhages. This is just blood under the conjunctiva. It can have a lot of mechanisms as far as Valsalva, sneezing, or you know, delivery if you're having um, a neonatal period. But you want to ask for the mechanism of trauma. And you also want to see what the look of the subconjunctival hemorrhage. If it's flat and well circumscribed, usually it's just a bruise. However, if you have it appearing bolus or 360, you have to be suspicious of an occult open globe. So this is a patient that actually had an occult open globe and underneath here where it was more bolus and balloon-like was actually some uvea that was sticking out underneath the subconjunctival hemorrhage. So again, you want to look for flat and well circumscribed. If you have it 360 in bolus, you have to be suspicious for an occult open globe. Corneal abrasions are going to be something that you will see. It can be from a finger poke while they were playing basketball or if they were playing in the playground, from a direct trauma. Sometimes it can be from a foreign body and they had taken it out. They'll present with pain and photophobia. A lot of times you can actually examine them a little bit better if you have preparacane. Again, that's not for treatment, but just to help the patient feel more comfortable so you can at least get a vision. Most of these will go away with an antibiotic ophthalmic ointment. But you want to look for any penetration or corneal perforation with a metallic foreign body or a foreign body um, from the playground. Things to watch out for is if you see vertical corneal abrasions, that usually will signify that there's a foreign body underneath the eyelid. And those can usually easily be removed with just a cotton tip applicator that's wet, and then all of a sudden they feel so much better. And most of these are going to be unwitnessed. Um, parents will say, oh, they were playing soccer and then they've been having eye pain for the past few days, and then you see that there's actually a piece of something underneath there. Corneal foreign bodies, though, that you'll see, you want to look for the trauma. It's usually sudden onset sensation. Again, playgrounds, if they were working with power tools, um, or sometimes, depending on what they were using as far as like a bat, sometimes you could have that. Usually you want to rule out for an open globe. So this patient um, had actually presented, and they were told, that they had a foreign body and actually was a piece of iris. So again, you want to look for other signs, the pupil not being well circumscribed. Okay. Again, you can remove this is easily either with a slit lamp or even just with a cotton tip applicator. And then you want to cover them with a broad spectrum antibiotic afterwards. Traumatic iritis is also something that can present in your office um, fairly easily. They usually present about within the first three to five days after the injury. And what they'll usually present with is that the pupil will look a little bit larger, more sluggish, and parents will say they're really photophobic. Their eye will be injected. What's important about the photophobia for these patients is that they actually will have what they call consensual photophobia, meaning that if you shine the light in the uninjured eye, they actually will have more pain in the injured eye. And that is because of the consensual pupillary response. And the pain is actually coming from spasm of the iris. And so 
Usually, this will resolve on its own if you give it time. If they're very uncomfortable, you can consider giving them a short acting dilating drop, such as cyclopentylate, to just give them some more time. Most of the time, it will resolve within a few days after the injury as well. Now, this is different from a hyphema, which is blood in the actual anterior chamber. This is due to rupture of the iris vessel. So this is a mild hyphema that you can see versus almost an eight ball hyphema. We always want to evaluate for any other injuries to the eye. And these patients need to be seen within the first, I would say one to even three days of the injury. The reason for this is that they have the highest risk of re-bleeding within the first three to five days from the injury. And what happens is that as the blood is cleared, it acts as if it's tamponading the actual bleeding vessel. But as it clears, you take off that scab and then you have increased bleeding afterwards. So these patients need an ophthalmology consult as soon as possible with a thorough eye exam. We usually will check for sickle cell prep for patients who may be at higher risk for that and treat with steroids and atropine to help relax the iris. We will sit, tell them to have bed rest, and I tell patients, the patient gets to be a couch potato. All they get to do is just sit and go to the restroom. Because the more they're jumping around, the more that you are actually irritating and making those blood cells flow around the in, in the anterior chamber, and then the less you will actually clear it and the higher risk for re-bleeding. Finally, some of these are the posterior segment that you can see in the trauma. This is choroidal rupture after a baseball injury. Once the hyphema cleared and you can actually get a good look to the posterior exam, this is actually a break right in the macula. And so what the patient experienced was that a scotoma or a missing spot in their vision. This is showing you a picture of what they call commotio retinae. It basically is edema on your retina from the impact. We will watch these patients for the first month after the injury until this clears because it puts them at a higher risk for a macular hole and that usually can be permanent. And finally, this is a picture of what they call retinitis glopatoria. What happens is you have this high impact, high velocity injury, usually from a BB gun. And usually you'll have the BB be in the orbit and it may not be removed, but unfortunately you've already caused damage due to the high velocity inside the eye. And again, this is not penetrating into the eyeball. It actually was just because of the velocity near the actual globe. And then if ever an open globe ever presents to your office, stay calm. <laughs> Place a shield on the eye and send them over. Tell them to elevate the head and avoid anything that they may be having balsalva or pressure on the globe because you don't want to extrude any intraocular contents. And what I usually say is, if you don't have a shield, improvise. Plastic cup, shield, okay? Don't ever use gauze because that's going to be putting pressure on the eye. I have always told plastic cups are great because then it makes them not touch the eye also. So some take home points. Eye protection for childhood sports is important. And what's going to be key is for many pediatricians, whenever you're doing the pre-participation sports physical, is actually identifying which patients need to have more eye protection. Those are going to be your unilateral um, blinded patients, or if they have had any history of amblyopia or strabismus, or if they're playing a sport that's going to be higher risk for injury. Glasses and sunglasses are not enough protection. You actually need to have safety sports eyewear that conforms to the American Society for Testing and Material Standards. They actually test these glasses so that they actually can, um, they do impact testing so that they can actually tell, okay, is this good for baseball versus football versus basketball? And you should have a link and also a handout just showing you what kind of, for each sport, what would be recommended as far as eye protection. Thank you for your attention.